socket shielding does not suck. Okay, guys, we this is a follow-up video to our socket shielding video that we posted a couple of weeks ago. And the reason I'm making this video is that for somehow in my uh, first podcast, people thought that because I don't do socket shielding, that somehow socket shielding in itself is a less than viable option. And so let's let's dive into the concepts behind socket shielding so you understand that it's not that it's not a viable option, it's just that it carries a certain amount of risk that I prefer not to carry into the practice for my patients. I've spent the last three days thinking about how to respond to the to the people who responded but were um, they were influenced by my passion, but not by my words. And what I mean by that is they, they, they listened and they, they thought they heard what I was saying, and they thought what I was saying was that socket shielding is not good. And that's not what I was saying. What I was saying was is that socket shielding is, is good until it goes bad. And then when it goes bad, the solution, the backup plan, is to remove the, the sick piece of the tooth, to take it out, and then typically to graft the now rather large defect that it's created with a bone graft and then come back and, and or do a concomitant connective tissue graft. So the question you have to ask yourself is that if you could accomplish equivalent aesthetic outcomes by doing the second procedure first and skip the first procedure, it's called a risk reduction protocol. And that's what, I, that's what I'm in propo proposing. I'm proposing that folks look at this and say, I can get the same outcome if I do an immediate extraction, maintain the buccal wall, and then do a gap graft, and then from gap graft, immediate provisionalization, and from immediate provisionalization, let them heal and get a beautiful outcomes where we're maintaining, not regaining that tissue. And by doing that, you, you get spectacular outcomes. And this is what we teach in our course. This is what I've been doing for years. So people are like, you can't do it. Yeah, you can. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. In other words, if I was having failures, I would evolve. I would say, I'm going to have to look into this other high, highly technically sensitive. Now, people also argue the point, well, uh, you know, it's, it's not that I've been doing it for a long time. And, but that's not true. Every single piece of literature, if you read any single piece of literature, Anywhere in PubMed, with reference to socket shielding, the first thing they say is it's technically sensitive. It requires hands. It requires a meticulous mindset where you go through each and every step, and it has to be precise. If you leave your, if you leave your, your remnant of tooth too tall, it's not going to work. You're going to get it. You're going to get an exposure, either internal or external. This is a problem. So if you look at the, the vast preponderance of people doing dental implants, not everyone has those kinds of skills. And so what I'm proposing is that perhaps there's another method that gives you equivalent outcomes that almost everyone can do. Now what we're doing is we're elevating the floor of dentistry across the board, not just for some elite 10 to 15% of the dentists that were gifted by Michelangelo kind of people with hands and also the mental fortitude to be able to step through this meticulous process, but just in general, the vast proponents of people that can do dental implants can have amazing outcomes in the aesthetic zone. One of the other things that was uh, fed back to us on the socket shielding video was what about folks with thin phenotype. So they have very thin biotype phenotype on the gingiva. And that's a, that's a valid point. But the solution to thin attached keratinized gingiva is a connective tissue graft. And no one's going to argue that. I mean, everyone can get behind. Just do a simple connective tissue graft and thicken that tissue. And you've, now you've got great attached tissue around your, uh, around your implant. So the, the idea that socket shielding, the socket shielding itself doesn't change your, your soft tissue profile. The soft tissue profile has to be changed through a soft tissue procedure like a connective tissue graft. So that's independent of the socket shielding. Socket shielding concept is to maintain the vitality of the buccal plate. Now, the buccal plate is less than one millimeter for almost everyone on the planet. So it's very thin. 
It has a very poor blood supply because it's mostly compact bone. So this is, this is an area where, number one, you have to be very good at your extraction technique because if you avulse the tooth with traditional uh, elevators, you're going to take the buccal plate with it. And with that, you have a, a, a defect that now you have to manage. So assuming that you know how to extract the tooth atraumatically, leaving the buccal plate intact, you now have a beautiful five-wall defect for a graft. And Carl Mist used to say, if you have a five-wall defect, you could put spit in there and it would grow bone. And I cannot not agree more. I mean, it's absolutely true. And how do we know this? Look at anyone who's healed from an extraction. They come to you. They're a new patient. They're missing a tooth. What is, what's, what's there? Bone. <laughs> you go, oh, you're missing a tooth. And there's bone. There's not a big hole. There's no Grand Canyon because you didn't do a bone graft. It fills if there's five walls it's going to fill with bone. So the idea is that you've got this sliver of tooth that's going to help hold that tissue. But more importantly, what happens is if you look at the cross-sectional view of people that report on these techniques, they get the implant in the right location. And the right location is palatal. All, all of the literature says over the last 20 to 30 years as we've really honed in on where do we want our implants to be, it's palo, right? Everyone knows that now. It's not a mystery. And what happens is, is that when you do socket shielding, it forces you. It forces the clinician to stay away from the buccal plate. You're not hitting the, the thin labial wall, which so many people did for so many years. Every person who's practicing dentistry knows, knows that when they go into hygiene, they see a handful of patients every year with an FP2 crown on tooth number eight or nine. Okay, And what that is, is an extremely long crown. Now, hopefully the patient has a low smile line and they can get away with it, but everyone sees it. You pull back the lip and you go, oh, when did you get the implant on tooth number eight? And it's clearly obvious. And why is that? Because the original placement was too labial and it blew out the buccal bone during the healing phase because it was too thin and there was no blood supply and it dies away and you get, a, you get an aesthetic concern. And the easiest way to manage that with a low smile line is an extremely long tooth, okay? And that's what you see all the time. Well, we're getting away from that now, right? Our, our, our patients are demanding better and our industry is better at this. We know better. So you've got to get the implant in the right location. Where's the right location? Lab, uh, uh, palatal, palatal. Socket shielding tells the doctor, here's where you're going to put it. You're going to put it not up against the buccal plate, not up against the tooth, but palatal to that. So I've seen cross-sectional images where the implant looks to be three to four millimeters away from the buccal plate. Guys, if you've got three millimeters or four millimeters of bone on the face, of, on the labial side of your implant, you're not going to have any transparency. You're not going to sow any gray through, and that thing's going to last f likely forever. Right? We can all agree on that. And it doesn't matter if you have four millimeters of bone or three millimeters of bone and one millimeter of a, of a tooth remnant, you're still going to have a win. Now, some people said to me, we all know that that bone's going to collapse. And they said, well, how do you know it's not going to collapse with your technique? Well, I have literature. They said, you don't have literature on it. Yeah, I do have literature. It's called Dennis Tarnow, okay? So Dennis Tarnow published a paper a number of years ago that showed a very, very lovely experiment that said if you take out a tooth and at the time of, of extraction, you place an implant, you gap graft, and then you provisionalize with a non-functional provisional that you can significantly minimize the hard and soft tissue collapse around a site. Now, that's much different than I'm going to take out a tooth, graft it, let it heal, come back in months, and place an implant. That's a different animal, okay? Completely different animal. And he has that in his paper, okay? And so it's in the literature. And if you try it and you have amazing outcomes, you now have another tool in your, in your toolbox. So for those folks that are like, this is the only thing I want to do, I really encourage you to consider taking out a tooth, keeping the buckle plate, Placing an immediate implant with a type 4 fully guided system so your implant is in the exact same position that you would if you were doing a socket shielding and gap grafting with a particulate graft. Now, this particulate graft could be a mineralized cortical concellus chips or it could be an allograft. So you could harvest it somewhere in the mouth and do it that way too, which is lovely because it's got all the growth factors. And give that a try on someone, preferably someone in the family, like 
your your mom or your or your your wife or something, right? Because that way you can track the healing. But you will find you will have amazing outcomes. And if you don't believe me, catch me at my next lecture when I'm on stage, when I'm showing my outcomes, because you're gonna be like, he's getting those outcomes without socket shielding. And it's spectacular. Why do you know why can you trust me that it's spectacular? Because if it wasn't, I wouldn't do it. In other words, if I wasn't getting spectacular outcomes, I would abort, I would change my protocol for the benefit of my patients. Guys, if you like this video, please give us a like and subscribe. If you have any comments, put them below so we can answer them. And if you have any ideas for future videos, we'd love to hear from you.